tengo moment by moment basis. So once again, welcome to Studio Church, and let's just take a moment to uh, introduce ourselves to each other. <laughs> How you doing? More importantly for uh, anyone listening online or watching online, <laughs> good to see you, man. Okay. You know, somebody mentioned to me once about um, uh, church service and uh, how big would a church service actually need to be. And um, according to the Bible, as long as there's one person listening to you, then you're sharing the word of God, and that is the purpose behind the Bible and behind Jesus. He did it one at a time. And a lot of times there were just crowds. So that's the purpose behind church. So let's, so let's just um, open in prayer. And... Uh, Welcome the Lord to our service. Father God, we just uh, raise up the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we just ask that you be with us here, Father, and be with us and, and uh, just honor us with your presence and the presence of the Holy Spirit as we uh, delve into the word today. Please make it meaningful to each one of us, everyone that's listening, Lord, and uh, help us to understand your word and how that, affits, how that fits into our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, you may be seated. So, have you noticed that uh, we're not instantly Christian, or we're not uh, uh, instantly secular, we're not anything along those lines? So we just have to uh, wonder, you know, what, what Christianity and what life and what uh, secularism and what the world and all those things, what they're all about individually. I mean, it's not like we're manufactured you know so this particular model here that's coming out now is just filled with evil it might do a couple of good things but uh, for the most part it's filled with evil and this particular model over here this one's filled with absolute good it might do a couple of evil things every once in a while but uh, for the most part it's all programmed to be good no it's not like that we're uh, we're all we all come from the same place where we're, we're basically void of all of the evil and all of the good. And we are so innocent and so pure that we can be taught all those things. I know the Bible says that um, uh, we originate from, the, from a source of, of, uh, of, uh, of evil. But uh, that is not the type of evil that we're talking about because uh, we're con conceived out of sin. I mean, that's what the purpose of that is. Not, not so much evil. But we're, we learn those things. We learn to be good. We learn to be evil. And uh, it takes time to build relationships. And it takes time to build the, the, the understanding and the, the uh, wherewithal, let's call it, on how to be a Christian. It also takes us time to understand how and wherewithal to how to be an, a not nice person, an evil person, or, or a person of... I, I don't want to lump people and uh, worldly and evil and all of that into the same place, but the way the world thinks doesn't support the way Christianity thinks or the way religion thinks. Now, if we look at Genesis 4, verses 17 to 24, it says in, Can in Cain's uh, family line, um, after Cain, or three or four generations later, there was this fellow by the name of Lamech. And... Uh, when Cain killed his brother Abel, Cain was saying, well, now people are going to kill me. And, and God says, well, no. If anybody kills you, it would be seven times the, uh, the curse on them if they do. Well, three generations, four generations later, Lamech, whose uh, great-great-great-granddad was, granddad was, uh, was Cain, he killed a guy for bumping into him or something like that. And then he bragged to his wives about that, his two wives. And he said... Uh, I have killed a man for hurting me. So if Cain was seven times the, uh, the curse, mine will be 77 times the curse. So y you see where that's going. Like it, it starts out at seven and he's 77 and the pride and the arrogance and everything else that goes along with that. That's just kind of a natural progression. And that's where the world goes. It's not that people individually, like him, 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 her, her, her and her, it's not like they're all evil, but, but the, the world just kind of sort of slides into that line of thinking, into something, uh, something I want to call incontinence. Now, it's got nothing to do with bladder, but 
And endure all the hardships that they never had to do in the Garden of Eden. So I'm, I'm just wondering if, if there's like a half a dozen generations there that just stepped back from God and say, "Oh well, enough of that." And we slowly watch that whole generation and that whole world slide into disrepair and into this dark place. So, but like I said, we never fall into Christianity or a relationship with God, but this incontinence can cause us to naturally degrade into secularism. And secularism is obviously different than Christianity or, or religion. Religion is an organized understanding of the way you should live your life, whereas secularism is an understand, under, understood standing that, that uh, you live your life according to the way you want to. Forget about God. That's got nothing to do with your life. So that's kind of the difference. So getting back to Cain for a minute, he was downcast. When Cain and Abel took their, uh, their uh, offerings to God, the, the sons of Adam and Eve, and uh, Abel um, looked after the livestock and Cain um, looked after the, uh, the gardens and that sort of thing. So they both, both brought their, their offerings to it and God accepted Abel's wholeheartedly. But then he looked at Cain and said, no, don't want it. Why? Was it because it's vegetables? Was meat better than what Cain was offering? No, it had nothing to do with that. It had everything to do with the motive. So if it's a clear definition there. If you just cut that right down the middle and you look at Abel's ability, he offered the meat offering, but his heart was in it. His heart was part of that relationship with God where he took it to God in a thankful, prayerful a meaningful way, whereas Cain looked at it and thought, well, you know, no, no, okay, I, I, I can do this, I can do better than that, and he went there with this sense of pride and this sense of ownership and this sense of, of, uh, of uh, a step above. So when you try and take an offering to God and give that to God, God will refuse it, but he will accept Abel's offering because his heart was right, whereas Cain's heart was wrong. So what happened? Cain killed Abel, killed his own brother in the field. And God said, to the, what have you done? He says, well, what am I, my brother's keeper? I don't know where he is. He says, his blood cries out to me from the soil, the very soil that you dig in. So, you see, I think that Abel's approach to God in a very humble, uh, thankful fashion outweighs everything. I mean, if you go to God with an offering or, or with a, 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 a thought process that, yeah, I'm here, God, yeah, I did it. I mean, we read that all through the whole Bible. That Nebuchadnezzar did the same thing. He said, I did this. But God slowly struck that down to the point where, no, you didn't do this. I allowed you to do this. You did this through me. So that's, that's kind of the underlying difference between the two. But if you look at Genesis 4, 7, it says, God said to Cain, Cain was downcast and he was sad and he was angry. And, and God said, why are you downcast? I mean, if you do what is right, you, will you not be accepted? Which Abel was. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. So you must rule over it. And that's the challenge that we have in life. That's the difference between Cain and Abel. We have, we're in the middle of that. And we have the option. When we're born as a child, we have the option to follow either one of those paths into absolute thankfulness and, 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 and uh, forgiveness and acceptance or into self-centered pride and, and arrogance and moving on through that, try and get around the fence that Jesus talks about. It says, well, many will come to the gate, but few will get in. Some will try and climb over. So who's climbing over? Not Abel. Abel's going there with the purpose of, of, of appeasing God, 
showing God that of, of his ad, ad, adoration for him. Whereas Cain was not showing that. Showing was, uh, Cain was showing how much strength he had personally as a person in front of God. You know, if we grew up as a child and knew nothing about God or religion, then if we are not careful, so we have no inkling of what religion or God or anything is about, and if we're not careful, we can grow up and, and we can be judgmental of people who are religious, who live their life wholeheartedly to the point that Abel did. And Cain judged him. And he killed him because he couldn't see, he couldn't see the beauty of that relationship that Abel had with God. So if we're secular and we grow up thinking that way, we can judge that person and, and, and treat them harshly, which he did. On the, on the flip side of that, if, if we grow up in an absolute uh, lifestyle where, where the Bible is uh, dealt with, where, where uh, we, we have it every single day, every meal, every we go to bed, we wake up in the morning, we pray, what, whatever, your, whatever your schedule is. If we have that, we grow up like that and we bring our children into that. If we're not careful, we can look at people like Cain and we can judge them harshly. So you see, the, the fact of judgment and, and, and weighing people for their, 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 what we think their worth is, is fully capable on both sides. The non-religious can judge the religious, and the religious can judge the non-religious. So if, if we get that path going, then <laughs> really, what, what, how, do, how do we get around that so we don't do that sort of thing? Now, what I'm, what I'm going to call, this is called um, periphery teaching. This is something where somebody uh, who's in the secular world or somebody who's in the religious world can pick a verse, a religious world c uh, com person can pick a verse out of the Bible, and you can use that to weigh other people's worth and weigh other people's, uh, um, um, let's call it obedience, to to the situations and, and rules and regulations in life. So that periphery line of thinking is very simple. It's like taking one verse out of the Bible, not listening to the whole context of that whole verse, not paying attention to the context of that whole chapter, not understanding the person that wrote that, and not understanding the whole book that it came from. So if we don't do all of those steps, and we just take that one verse, that's called periphery teaching, I'm going to call it. And that's a dangerous place to be because you can lay heavy laws on people. You can judge people harshly. You can, you can hurt them emotionally and physically and, and, uh, and spiritually. You can rip them apart. But what the biggest damage behind all of that is we lose grace. We're, su we're supposed to be, as a, as a, a, a religious person and a, and a Christian, we're supposed to be extending grace to people. People who don't have grace, who people who never get grace. People who are treated harshly all the time because the world, that's the way the world is. That's just what they do. And that's what you're, you're supposed to accept. But that's not really what it's all about. I mean, 1 Corinthians 10.25, it says, um, periphery, te sorry, periphery teachings are when you focus on that one rule or law and disregard all of the rest. And here's a good example of that in 1 Corinthians 10, 25. It says, eat anything sold in, in the meat market without raising questions of conscience. Now, there's a lot of talk in the Bible about um, uh, meat being offered to idols, and, and uh, you shouldn't eat that. You shouldn't even uh, associate with a person that does that. But God says, really, what, 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 what's that meat going to do to you? If you have your belief system in God and you understand God wholeheartedly, then why would eating a piece of meat offered to an idol affect you or damage your relationship with God? It won't. Unless, unless you start thinking. If you have these inklings about why that meat was being offered to idols, then that is the catch. That's the catch we're talking about. The things that drag you into these 
these areas of, uh, of study and areas of understanding that, that take you away from the solid presence of God. Now, that grace is, it's, it's how, to, how to apply grace, how to accept people where they're at. It's not taking that verse out of the Bible that says, thou shalt not, blah, blah, blah. And then this person doing that, and us going, yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah, well. It, it, that's not the purpose. That's not the point. The point isn't all about that. The point is all about these people individually seeing this and understanding. And the, and the whole purpose behind that verse that I just read about eating meat in the market, er, uh, buying meat in, in the market that's, that's uh, being offered to idols, then it's about those people watching you go into the meat market where you know that that meat is offered to idols or going into the liquor store because of the, the image that that creates. I mean, whatever reason you're there for, that person doesn't know. They just see you going into a liquor store. That's all. And they go, oh, okay, hypocrite. So those are the judgmental things that fire back and forth between the secular world and the, and the religious world. And the secular world says the religious world is just a bunch of bunk. It's a bunch of, of trappings in order to drag us down. And the religious world says those people will never change. How, where does it stop? I mean, it doesn't stop. It just goes on and on and on. And it can go on in the finest churches in the world because it still happens. So Romans twelve seventeen says, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Now, there's two meanings to that. The first one is I'm talking about this secular guy looking at the Christian going into the, to the meat market or the liquor store or wherever <coughs> for whatever reasons we don't know. Because they're not going to go up there and go, hey, why are you going in there? Why are you buying that meat? They just see that Christian doing those things. Just because we are at a place in our life where we... we our, our uh, religion doesn't mean that it just being religious doesn't mean we've made it. It doesn't mean that. Well, I'm I'm a Christian now. I have all the answers. You just come to me, <laughs> and I'll answer all your questions. No, it, it doesn't get anywhere near that. You can ask any leader in the, in the, in in Christianity. If they have all the answers, then they will all say, no, I don't have any of the answers. All I do is just recite what's in the book. I mean, if it's in the book and it says it, then that's all I need to know. You still don't have all the answers, even though you could memorize the entire book and pull out every single verse on a whim, but that doesn't mean you have all the answers. It doesn't mean anything, except that people go to you for when they need questions answered. Romans 12, 8, it says, If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Like I said, this person over here doing things that are against biblical principles might not necessarily understand that they're doing anything wrong. So for this Christian to look at that person and, and instantly judge them, you can sometimes just see it on people's faces and in their mannerisms how they react to people who are doing things that go against the teachings of the Bible. Those are the kind of things, those are the judgments that come from inside. We know that it says, uh, thou shalt not whatever, and that person is doing it, and they're not responding to this verse, and we judge them for that. Whereas this person is just doing life. I'm like, Dude, I don't know anything about that book. Never read it. Never seen one. Never had one in my home when we were growing up. If we did grow up in a household, living a life of a Bible-believing Bible person that does not give us license to degrade other people from where they are in their life, we're to be the example, like it says in Romans 12, 17. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If you do what is right, try to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. It keeps you out of places where even Christians looking at Christians can heap 
piles of judgment on there because they assume there, that, that there's, in reality, there's this kind of hierarchy in Christianity that the longer a person's in, in, in Christianity and the more they study, the more they know and the more mistakes they see in, in the people who are new to Christianity. So they can be very judgmental about those people and the proper thing to do is to go and discuss it with them, but I want to say 99% of the time that never happens. People don't go and discuss things with you. They discuss things with other people. And they will take situations that happen in a church or in a Christian setting and discuss it with people outside the church. I'm, I'm guilty. I've done that. Because I didn't know what to do. Don't know where to go. Don't know how to apply all these things. I know I got the book full of a thousand answers here, but man, I don't know. I don't know the answer to these things. I don't know how to apply all this stuff. So you have to learn all this stuff as you go, and the secular world is what sees that. That's what they watch, is they watch us doing those things. So this natural degradation, degradation this, this, uh, the, takes place in every single, this incontinence. It just takes place in everything in your life that you stand for. If you stand for something, there will be this incontinence that will continually be picking and chipping away at the things that you believe in. And there's, there's a reason for that. Because if it's false, and there's this picking and chipping away at this thing, pretty soon when you get to the core, there's nothing. Suddenly you realize, oh, okay, now I understand. And if you are solid in your belief system and you have this core of Jesus Christ and this belief system that is infallible, it's founded on a rock, as the Bible says, and the just continual picking away, the core doesn't change. So if people get to the core, the, the person being picked at can slowly look at this and go, wow, that's, this is too much for me. I can't handle this. So that's why it's important for us, Christians, and just people in general, to not be so judgmental about other people. You know, there's in, in biology, there's this thing called degradation. It's the natural degradation, natural degrading of something because of bacteria, fungi, or other biological means. You know, and we age, and that's a, that's a good example right there. But we can get old naturally, or we can accelerate it by using and abusing drugs and alcohol or abusing our diet or, or even extreme sports. I mean, that that's can be pretty harmful from what I hear. So have you ever wanted to just run away from a problem? There's a, you see this problem coming at you and you know it's a problem. You know it's a person of that character and you know that it, it's going to affect you some way. It's going to encircle you. It's going to encompass you. It's going to drag you down, and you're going to have to deal with it. Well, there's two ways to look at that. Y you can see it as an attack from the enemy, or you can look at it as the, a practicum in a course that you're taking. Because we're all on this planet learning something, so let's call that practicum, okay? That is what your belief system is all about. If it, it is tested to see if you're true to your word. And these little tests and, and problems that come at us, they're, they're, they're there to test us, to find out if, if, uh, if what we believe is, is true and solid enough. And if we can withstand, with, with, withstand all of the attacks, then, uh, then we're true to our word. You know, sometimes people do things out of accident, not knowing that there's any need to to pounce on them. So, I mean, for uh, uh, somebody over here with that has all the answers, we don't need to jump on somebody with a box full of Bibles in order to uh, get them to understand what the book says. That's not what it's all about. And here's a topic. There's no need to reprimand somebody for making a mistake. And And... There's a place for that where people are willfully disobedient, then they need to be dealt with in a different manner than somebody who just makes a mistake and goes, oh, sorry, geez, I didn't realize that. So that, that's kind of the difference, and, and that's where 
James 1, 5, it says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. Note here it says without repro- reproach. With, and that, what that means is no disappointment and no disapproval. So you make a mistake, you understand you made a mistake, and, you, and you're able to work at it and correct your ways. And, and Christianity is to reach out to those people and talk to those people in a non-confrontational, non-disappointing, and non-disapproval way. And the best way to do that is just be who you are supposed to be and not who you think you can be. Because when you think you can be something, then you're probably not. But if you think you're not something, then you probably are. Moses is a good example of that. He thought he was nothing, but he turned out to be one of the most influential people in the Bible. Joseph was that way. He was innocent enough for him to be judged over and over and over again because of his dreams and because of of the things that he knew. Yet, what happened to him? He became one of the most influential people in Egypt and in the whole world at that time. Sometimes God just gives us the answer, and other times God just needs to massage that, that whole working into our life because we just don't get it. We can go through the same thing over and over and over again and, and still make the same mistakes, but we don't understand why. We don't, it doesn't make sense to us until one day, you know, have, have, you, have you ever gotten to a situation where you got yourself in trouble and you knew, you suspected it was wrong, but you went ahead and did it anyway and, and all of a sudden you get through the other side, you're in trouble and you go, oh, that's what that means. That's what that's all about. You know, people look at that and think, oh, come on, you didn't know that? Well, maybe not. Necessar- not necessarily so. Because sometimes you can hear something over and over again and, and, not, and not make sense of it until, until you actually see it happen in your own life. You can watch it in other people's life and you think, well, that's just stupid. But when it happens in your own life, you go, oh, wow, those people weren't stupid. Now I understand. So in a biblical sense, all we have to do is look at Adam and Eve at a tragic event where Adam and Eve partook of the knowledge of good and evil. Suddenly their eyes were opened and they knew they were naked. They bit the apple. God spent all that time building that beautiful garden and then he walked in there with them. They could do anything they wanted in that garden and everything was available to them. They didn't have to work for it. And God was there with them. And they, they couldn't understand. They couldn't wrap their head around the freedom that they had. They couldn't wrap their head around the, the elegance of that garden and everything being in there. So they had to do something in order to find the flip side of that, to find out, ooh, I really don't like this. I want that back, but it's too late. 90% of the time when you, when you do those things and you make those mistakes, it's too late. Sometimes you can go back and you can, you can seek forgiveness and people will forgive you and everything will be restored, but let's face it, a lot of the times the people over here, I, I, had a, I had a supervisor like this one time where if the person made a mistake, he'd say, fire him, get a new one. Get a new one? Seriously? That's what you're quality control is involved that's what it's circum that's what it's all circled around is get a new one doesn't that happen to us all the time today i mean we know something's wrong we do it anyway and then afterwards it just kind of blindsides us and we go wow oh i shouldn't have done that now i understand why it's so wrong so subtle we're manipulated when that happens. It's, it's like we're being played like a deck of cards, like we're just a seven of spades or a seven of diamonds or something. And we come out the other side and we realize how, how foolish our thought processes were and how every opportunity we had to stop that and correct it, but we didn't take it. We left it. Or we might think, you know, that we know the things are wrong, but we look at it and go, well, I, I just... I wonder, I'm curious, what would happen if I did this? 
and the same result. That's twisted thinking. <laughs> that's, that's not right. You're being manipulated. You're being played like, the deck, like a deck of cards. When you get those inklings in your head, that's the evil one trying to get you to bite that apple so that you understand the difference between good and bad. Why wouldn't we just stay in the garden for crying out loud and be good and do what we have to do? Why do we have to mess around and twist everything and wreck everything and, and make these stupid, stupid mistakes that lead to nothing but heartache? Why? You know, when that, when that happens, it, it's just kind of, it becomes somewhat surreal. When, when you're in the process of making those mistakes, you're, you're, you're thinking, gee, is this right? Hmm, is, is this right? And all of a sudden you come out the other side, and it might be years down the road. Not, it might not just be right away, but you look back and you go, oh, gee, I was so stupid. Why did I ever get involved with that? Why didn't I just stay away? Those inklings that you have that it's wrong mean it's wrong. It's just wrong. Even if it's right, and it has to be proven to you that it's right, maybe it's just wrong for you. Maybe it's just wrong for you to learn what that is, because if you learn that, hatch that little seed, something might happen down the road as a direct result of that. And if you had never done that to begin with, that wouldn't have happened. Those little inklings are God's conscience twisting it and poking at us, saying, well, don't do it, don't, 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 don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. But we don't listen to that. We just do it anyway. And, and it, it's kooky curiosity that prevails in our thinking that causes these problems in our life. You see it when you're buying shoes. I mean, you go out and buy, uh, the shoes are on for 25 bucks on sale. So you buy the shoes. And in three to six months, their soles coming off or the laces or eyelets are coming out or something. But if you spend a couple hundred dollars waiting to save up for that pair of shoes and you buy a good quality pair of shoes, it'll last you years. Uh, now, now that's, that works in this example, but uh, uh, there's, I heard a woman say to me, she says, that's okay, I don't mind buying those shoes because I like new shoes every three to six months. And I said, okay, well, that's a school of thought. I guess if you add it up over the long run, it probably works out about the same anyway. So we play that game over and over again, you know, and every death of something hatches something beautiful. Even when we go through these troubles and suddenly we realize it's, it's the birth of something beautiful. Now we know how wrong that thinking was and that can guide our steps into the future. When we come across those situations and circumstances in similar fashion, we know how to avoid them. Unless we want to go through all the problems again and again, have all those other problems, blah, 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 blah. That's, that's completely up to us. I mean, it's completely individually. It's up to you. It's up to me. It's up to everybody. So 2 Peter 2.1, it says, But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there are false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who brought them. Secretly introducing destructive heresies. Now let's look at the meaning of heresy. It says nonconformity, dissension, unorthodox thinking. So if those opportunities come across our desk and we look at it and we go, oh, I don't know about that. I don't know. Those particularly Christians that, that bring those things to you and it creates those inklings in you and, and you ignore those and you just believe on the authority of that person, those those are heresies, and that, that's called false teachers. So if you take a verse out of the Bible, one verse out of the Bible, and you change it, that's called false teaching. That's heresy. That's a false prophet. So the Bible's very clear on that, you know, and, and the living word of God means, living in the word of God means sacrifice. 
We have to sacrifice our wants and our desires so, because they don't line up with the word of God. And when, when we get that situation where things come into our life and our biblical thinking and all of our understanding comes to that point and they meet in the middle and, and things grate on each other, it usually means there's some sort of a problem there and you've got to look at that. You have to study that. You have to figure that out. You have to understand what's creating all of the... the and it could just be that... Um, way back when you learned this verse that money is the root of all evil. Well, it's not. It's the love of money is the root of all evil. So it could be things like that that have, that have caused your thinking to get flipped over and you're dealt out like a deck of cards because that's what you believe. Because you never take the time to dig into the Bible and do some research. It, I challenge you, it's a lot of fun. Once you find some of these things out and you realize how silly they all are in, in, for the most part, it's interesting. It's empowering. It gives you some sort of understanding as to the Bible and how it applies to your life. It makes it real. It's not a question anymore. It's not, it's not something that, 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 that somebody says <coughs> because they're Christian and four agreed with them doesn't make it right because they didn't study the Bible either. They just heard a verse from somebody who heard a verse from somebody who heard a verse from somebody. And over the course of time, I don't know if you've ever played that game of people sitting in a circle and you tell a secret at one end, and by the time it gets around, it's totally different. There's words missing, there's words added, there the meanings concocted, it's, it's, it's all messed up. So, here in closing, you know, when, when I started my, my seminary studies, there's one thing that they kept pointing out to me and kind of drilled it into my head that now I didn't understand the meaning of it, not fully. I mean, I, I sort of understood it, but the further along I get, the more I understand where it says that you have the exemplary power to judge people unfairly. And that's what taking one verse out of the Bible does. It judges people unfairly. It's exemplary because it's, you're taking the pure word of God and you're just, you know, just tweaking it just a bit, you know, to certain, you know, fit this circumstance because this person is so unruly and so out to lunch. They need this verse, you know, just like this. That's the wrong thing to do. That's false teaching. That's, that's a false prophet. And God doesn't like that. It's very clear. All you have to do is read for that. You read that for yourself. But it also means that, that sacrificing the self, the interests of self. So you have to ask yourself this question. Can I live my life absolutely free of judging others when I see someone doing something wrong that I know is wrong in the Bible? Can you do that? I catch myself a lot. I, I, I see somebody doing something wrong, and the first thing, is, your first reaction is run over there and rescue them. Well, that's not what they want. And when you do that, they put, you receive pushback. And if you're overpowering, then you get criticisms, and you get judgments from this school of thought to this school of thought of the religious. Matthew 5, 44 and 45, it says, But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain over the righteous and the unrighteous. God doesn't judge people. Why should we? God doesn't look unfavor unfavorably on, on evil people. Why is that? Because they might be just ignorant of, of the facts. Like I said, don't punish a person for making a mistake. These people over here are probably just making mistakes. They're probably just, yeah, they know there's a Bible there. I've never opened it. I don't know what it says. But this is what everybody's doing, so it must be right. Is that, is that a clear disrespect of God and, and his Bible, or is that just ignorance? 
And so for, for a person in the know, a person with understanding, somewhat, when they try and twist those words in order to make that person feel guilty, you're just making it worse. It's like throwing grass in the bread dough. It's going to be there forever. Even when you bake it, it's going to be there. You'll see it. It's never going to go away. So every seed that a Christian casts into a secular world with that intent will always grow even if that person in the secular world that's making those mistakes grows out of that, those weeds and those, those grass stems will, will go, go with them until they get to the point where they have enough knowledge and they can look at it and say, well, that's garbage. I don't need that. But I got it from a Christian. So just because some, somebody does something wrong, that you have this fervent judgment based on principles does not give you the right to lift up one sole verse out of the Bible and persecute that person with it. Persecute. John 9.31 says, We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. We don't know if all of those people have had the opportunity to do God's will. We don't know if all of those people have heard of the word of God. You know, there's a, here's, the, here's the hard line difference. For me, I, I don't know about you, but when, when, when I see a group of people and they don't know the Lord, but they know there's a Bible, a lot of times, and I've experienced this, speaking with people, that they didn't think that they had the opportunity or the right to grab that Bible and, and, and learn th things from it. Because they'd been trained by the secular world to think that you shouldn't. So when we judge people, whether they be an upstanding Christian and they do things by accident, like going to the wrong place, but we don't know the, the reason that they were there. We don't know the motive. And we compare that with a person here who knows that there's a Bible and knows there's Christians, but doesn't feel right, doesn't feel welcome, doesn't feel a part of that whole system because nobody's ever shown them or extended the kindness to them that would allow them to do that. Do you know that the person you have in your thoughts because they are doing something wrong according to your understanding of the Bible? Are they willfully doing that? Or are they completely oblivious to the fact? Or are they struggling with their faith? They have me may have seen a lot of the bread dough with grass in it like I mentioned earlier. And that bread was baked and it's been in their lives all their life and they just see Christianity as being a loaf of bread filled with garbage they don't see any value in it they don't see any good in it they've never experienced it everybody in their family everybody in their friends and school and wherever they all live that, that lifestyle with bread was filled with grass and twigs in it. That's our challenge. Those are the questions we need to focus on, not the fact that they're sinning. Are they a Cain or are they an Abel? Are they doing those things because the way they were taught and they're still offering what they have based on what they've learned? Or are they pridefully standing up and saying, no, this is me. This is the way I am. God, take me, like me or not. 
we have to also have to say that about the, the, the Christians on this side. I mean, it's it's the same game. It's it's the same understanding. It doesn't change from group to group. All it changes is because one has a label over here, and this one has a label over here. So, Father, I just pray that everyone listening to this message, Lord, is is able to just put themselves out on their whole life, Lord, out on the table in front of you. And just, we ask that you honor the things that are honoring to you and bring to question the things that don't honor you, Father. We also ask that the people you put in our life, that we are far more attuned to their situation, circumstances, and the way they believe things, Lord, as opposed to how we think they should believe. We just pray all of these things, Lord, in your holy, precious name. Amen. So last week I gave you a, an assignment to build an equation based on balance. The answer is balance. And you have the power, the exemplary power, to put into that equation everything negative and everything positive that's in your life so that comes out, the answer is balance. That equation is extended again this week, so make sure that you uh, take some time to think about those things. And I do encourage you to uh, spend some time in prayer with God, spend some time in the Bible, and try to learn the understandings and the teachings and all of the things that associate what a religious life truly is. Thank you.